Okay, so I'm going to talk about physical activity and cancer survival. I'm going to present some observational data and some clinical trial data as well. Okay, don't have any uh, commercial support for the uh, for these studies or any um, conflict of interest. Not from Nike or Nike. No, and there are very few drugs to uh, promote behaviors. So, okay, so despite advances in adjuvant treatment, over 40,000 women still die of breast cancer each year. Current therapies do not address the association of obesity and sedentary lifestyle effects on prognosis, yet obesity and physical inactivity are common before and after a breast cancer diagnosis as well as other cancers. We've known for 20 years um, that physical activity decreases the risk for breast cancer. This is a slide of about 15 different prospective cohort studies that show about a 30 to 40 percent reduction in risk of breast cancer. So in cohort studies, physical activity is measured about 10 to 20 years before the diagnosis, so when women are healthy. So there's little um, bias related to, to recall bias or something. And these are adjusted for all the other um, risk factors known to be associated with breast cancer. So strong evidence of about a 30 to 40 percent reduction in breast cancer with about two to three hours per week of moderate intensity physical activity. These findings have also been observed in um, 20 to 30 different case control studies with similar uh, reduction in risk of about 30 to 40 percent. So what's explaining this, um, the mechanism of physical activity decreasing the risk? Um, we know that the association is um, a little bit stronger in postmenopausal women. It's stronger actually in non-white ethnicities. Um, it's the recreational activity, the organized or structured activity. Um, and also actually lifetime or later time activity, meaning it's never too late to start an exercise program and that later life may be better than the athlete in high school who then becomes inactive later on. It's uh, definitely a higher intensity, moderate to vigorous intensity activity, but most importantly, the role of body mass index. The association has been stronger in lower BMIs, um, and so BMI may be a mediator or it may modify the, the association. So we, we know from, this is a study from the um, cancer prevention study from American Cancer Society that showed um, that obesity before diagnosis is strongly related to death in a number of different cancers. Um, so with breast cancer here, and this is in, in women, um, we see about a two-fold increased risk of death um, with women who have a BMI greater than 30 versus less um, than 25. Also for the men, we see a strong relationship with higher um, cancer death associated with um, higher BMIs for a number of different cancers. And so this is um, BMI measured before diagnosis and then, you know, men and women are followed and, and so many um, deaths are higher um, among the obese versus lean. But what about BMI at diagnosis? So this was a study published um, a handful of years ago that showed a strong uh, relationship of, of increasing BMI with increased risk of death and recurrence. Um, and this is, uh, you know, around that BMI, the overweight category of 25. And a number of studies that have come out in the past five years have shown a similar association. So not only is being overweight or obese at diagnosis a, an adverse risk for, for poor prognosis, but also weight gain. So we know um, within the first year or two after diagnosis that some of the treatments, the chemotherapies or um, some hormone therapies may be associated with weight gain. And so that um, in this study, um, greater than a two, kilogram, uh, two BMI increase, which is about a 10 pound gain um, in women about 200 pounds, was about close to a two-fold increased risk of, of breast cancer death compared to those who maintained their weight after diagnosis. And so this 10 pound gain, is that common among uh, breast cancer survivors? We did show in the HEAL study, which is a prospective cohort study following about 1,200 women from diagnosis to 10 years out. Within the first two years after diagnosis, about 67 percent of women gained weight and on average gained about four kilograms or about 10 pounds. This is adjusted for all different factors, treatment stage and whatnot. So weight gain is common. And so what's explaining this weight gain? Perhaps it could be physical activity. We showed also in the HEAL study that physical activity after diagnosis was significantly reduced than the pre-diagnosis levels. And some of these women do return after treatment is, uh, is complete, do return to pre-diagnosis levels, but about 50 percent do not. So this decrease in physical activity levels after diagnosis of cancer could explain the weight gain. Now how about these reduced physical activity levels? What, what association, um, what effect does that have on survival? In the HEAL study, we did show uh, that 
higher levels of physical activity were associated with about a, a 50 percent reduction in death um, from breast cancer and in total deaths. And in fact, the um, middle category here, which is doing any recreational physical activity, so one bout a week of, say, a, a, a walk or a jog or um, basketball or something like that, one exercise bout a week could significantly improve your survival. So the skeptics out there would say, oh, these, these individuals were just healthier to begin with, and that's why they were able to exercise. So there's some statistical manipulation you can do with this. You can remove those who had a, an event within the, um, a year or two after the physical activity assessment. You also remove those who were undergoing treatment when physical activity was assessed, and you still find these, perhaps a bit, a bit attenuated, but you still find these improvements in survival. You also can stratify and look at if a disease stage or treatment or grade uh, modify, and you actually show among those with a higher disease stage, there's a, an actual stronger association of higher levels of physical activity improving survival. So it's pretty convincing. The Nurses Health Study also showed a similar finding. Michelle Holmes out of um, Harvard present, uh, published this a couple years ago showing that with about um, the three med hours per week is, is equivalent to about one hour per week of modern intensity exercise. And the nine METs is the recommended amount of physical activity, about two to three hours per week of, of, of a modern intensity activity. And showed also about a 50% reduction in recurrence, breast cancer death, and total deaths. And it's important to focus on the total deaths aspect because physical activity isn't only associated with breast cancer outcomes, but cardiovascular and diabetes and other chronic diseases that women and, and men diagnosed with cancer and undergoing treatment may be at risk for these, say, cardiovascular um, outcomes. Okay, so also with the Nurses Health Study, stratified by looking at the association of activity on, on survival, the, uh, the finding was strong, uh, similar in premenopausal and in postmenopausal women. Um, however, it was limited to those with ER receptor, uh, estrogen receptor positive tumors, implying probably an estrogen pathway. Um, if you look at stage of disease here, stage one, two, and three, uh, you see with the stage three, it's the uh, uh, greatest risk reduction among the higher disease stage, and these are adjusted for other risk factors. Okay, so getting at the mechanisms, if, if you hopefully I've, I've uh, got you to believe that there is a potential association between activity and improved survival, I mentioned body fat as being one of the strongest um, mechanisms or, or modifiers perhaps. There's a lot of research now looking at the role of insulin and IGFs and adipokines on um, as a mediator or um, a surrogate marker of recurrence and mortality. So there's only really been two studies published looking at um, and one, actually ours is in press, looking at the role of insulin or C-peptide on survival. Um, Pamela Goodwin reported a couple years ago, she showed that um, insulin levels measured um, at di right after diagnosis, that those who were in the top quartile of insulin levels compared to the bottom had about a two-fold increased risk of recurrence and a three-fold risk of death. We also showed a similar finding with C-peptide, that those in the top tertile versus the bottom had a three-fold risk of breast cancer death. This, these were, um, those with diabetes were removed from the analyses. And what we did is a secondary analysis where we created a fourth group of those with diabetes compared to the, the three groups of um, no diabetes but higher levels of C-peptide. And those with diabetes had a three-fold, three-and-a-half-fold increased risk of breast cancer death. So when we look at this in a, a figure, as you can see, there is this dose-response uh, uh, association with higher insulin and a uh, higher risk of, of death and similar in our, our findings showing um, the increased risk of, of death. So insulin um, is thought to be a strong um, mediator or surrogate marker of, um, of, of the relationship of exercise on survival. Another um, recent finding is the role of um, CRP or uh, as a chronic measure of inflammation. And we showed that higher levels of CRP measured about two years after um, breast cancer diagnosis those who had CRP in the top tertile had about a two-fold increased risk of breast cancer death um, compared to those in the, the bottom tertile. Also, um, we looked at adiponectin and we showed a, um, lower levels of um, adiponectin, um, be, I'm sorry, higher levels of adiponectin being um, beneficial um, with a reduction of, of death of about uh, 60 percent. Okay, so the next question is, all that data is observational, which is, which is important to, to move the field forward, 
But what's really important is whether it, you intervene with a behavior such as exercise or weight loss, and if that can improve prognosis. So Jennifer Ligabel out of um, Dana-Farber published a study last year where she enrolled 100 overweight sedentary breast cancer survivors into a 16-week strength and aerobic exercise program uh, versus usual care. Her primary endpoint was insulin and then also some anthropometric <coughs> measures and some other um, biomarkers. And what she showed is just over four months, a strong reduction in insulin levels among exercisers compared to controls, almost a 30% reduction in insulin, which is greater than that seen perhaps with metformin or other drugs that are actually now being used um, in breast cancer survivors to decrease the risk. Um, but of most interest is the fact that this decrease in insulin was seen in the absence of weight loss. Um, there was just modest weight, weight change over the four, four months. Um, so we also conducted a study here. At, um, we used the Yale New Haven Hospital Tumor Registry to recruit women into a year-long exercise program to look at the effect of exercise on favorably changing some of these biomarkers of prognosis, primarily insulin and IGFs, inflammation and adipokines, body fat, breast density and quality of life. And so what we did is we, uh, we recruited about 75 women. The mean age was uh, 55 years old, mostly non-Hispanic white and highly educated. They were all physically inactive at baseline, as you can see, about 13 minutes per week, um, which is very common of uh, most um, adults. Um, BMI of about 30 and mostly stage one and two with uh, mostly radiation and chemotherapy and a mixture of of either tamoxifen aromatase inhibitors or no hormone therapy. And some, um, when we submitted this grant, a lot of the reviewers thought there's no way you're going to get middle-aged and older women to exercise 150 minutes per week if they've historically never exercised. So, you know, we were motivated, and what we did is we did show that it is difficult to get women to exercise, but um, over 75% did do 60 minutes per week about 60% doing over 90 minutes per week. Our goal was the 150 minutes per week um, compared to the um, usual care group who had very little physical activity. When they wore pedometers at baseline and follow-up, we showed an increase of about 1,600 steps, which is about a mile a day um, of exercise, uh, which assuming a 20-minute walk was about 20 minutes per day of walking increase. So even just on average of about 100, you know, this is the mean, but people who are very active pull it up. So if you assume about 60% doing 90 minutes per week, what does that, what are the effects of that? Well, we did show a loss in body fat among exercisers and a slight gain, um, and this is over the year, among usual care women who were just told if they wanted to exercise, they could, but they had to do it on their own. We wouldn't offer them our program until the end of the study. Um, so there was a significant weight, uh, body fat loss measured by DEXA scans um, over the year. Also of, of note is the fact that um, bone mineral density was maintained and lean mass was actually increased among the exercisers compared to losses in the control group, uh, which, you know, loss in bone mass um, could be because of chemotherapy um, and changes in lifestyle as well or some other treatments, hormone therapy, aromatase inhibitors. Okay, so as far as insulin and IGFs, we showed a reduction in insulin, IGF-1 and BP-3, and increases actually in the control group. Um, and these were clinically meaningful between group differences um, between the two groups. Unfortunately, we didn't see any difference in leptin and adiponectin between the two groups. In fact, you'd want to see increases in adiponectin with exercise. This could be because of, of the, there wasn't enough weight loss or the dose of exercise wasn't enough. That, say, on average, a 90 minutes per week isn't enough or only a, you know, a 2% um, loss of body fat. Perhaps greater amounts, so a, maybe a, uh, a dietary-induced weight loss program with exercise is necessary to see the changes in the adipokines. Also, CRP, similar finding, decreases but no between-group differences perhaps not enough weight loss or not high um, enough dose of exercise to see those um, changes. So these findings do suggest it is feasible to increase activity after cancer diagnosis, that higher levels of activity um, decrease the risk of recurrence and death to, due to all causes in breast cancer by about 50%, and that the mechanisms meeting this um, are perhaps body weight, insulin, IGFs, and possibly adipokines and inflammation. So what's next? Um, dissemination of these research findings and other studies that have, have been published. Um, so, you know, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead? 
24 hours a day. Harsh, but very true. And so I think it has to become a priority. Um, when women and men finish their cancer treatment, um, I think the best thing to do is to have cancer survivorship programs in place where it's a, a natural transition. It's part of their treatment that um, is it's just similar to their chemotherapy and radiation. It's a natural transition into these programs. And also most important that the, the patients, believe it or not, they listen to their clinicians. And so it's important to recommend um, these lifestyle behavior changes and refer patients to the appropriate counselors. So there's some, American Cancer Society and American College of Sports Medicine have developed a certification exam for personal trainers um, and other fitness professionals to be certified in um, exercise training cancer survivors. So what that means is they know how to modify or adapt exercise programs um, based on any kind of side effects you may have, whether it be lymphedema or peripheral neuropathy. And perhaps um, working with those certified trainers, maybe um, insurance companies will reimburse those programs. There's other programs, um, Live Strong or the Lance Armstrong Foundation has partnered with YMCAs to offer free exercise programs in their YMCAs around the country for cancer survivors. There's um, an organization called Yoga Bear, which has free yoga classes for cancer survivors, and these are all over the country. So I think as clinicians to um, recommend exercise and then refer, um, refer them to the cancer survivorship programs and then also to these programs is um, really important. So future research directions. We need more studies of lifestyle and survival and other cancers. I uh, presented mostly data just for breast cancer, but there's no reason to think that um, exercise doesn't also improve ovarian, endometrial, and prostate cancer prognosis. We need more exercise and weight loss trials with more novel endpoints, such as also looking at side effects of treatment, inflammation, cell proliferation, and also an actual endpoint of disease-free survival. Um, I've been fortunate to get some funding, so I have two big studies starting up. Um, now we're going to start recruitment in January. And so one is a study among breast cancer survivors taking aromatase inhibitors who have arth uh, at least mild arthralgia to look at if exercise can decrease arthralgia severity and then to look at the mechanisms. Um, we know that arthralgia is quite common in women taking in AIs and also a, a, a strong reason um, for stopping the AI or discontinuing it, which adversely affects their survival. So if we can look at if exercise can improve severity and then the mechanisms, um, then hopefully that'll also give more evidence for having insurance reimbursed programs. Um, Tish Knopf here at Yale also has a study looking at exercise on bone mineral density among those who have a high risk of um, bone loss, so maybe women transitioning from pre to postmenopause or um, certain cancers such as, as breast cancer. So both studies are recruiting breast cancer survivors from Yale and other um, hospitals in the state. We also have an ovarian cancer um, trial looking at the effect of exercise on um, ovarian cancer uh, quality of life and then also um, peripheral neuropathy and then um, prognosis looking at certain serum hormones and then a secondary analysis may be to look at progression-free survival. Uh, Gil Moore just submitted a 600-page SPOR application yesterday. Um, so in one of those SPOR projects, uh, there's an ovarian SPOR, is to look at the interactions between genetic, molecular, and lifestyle factors on progression-free survival in ovarian cancer. We also um, have some other studies pending looking at um, cell proliferation um, measured uh, via fine needle aspirate and then perhaps um, weight and uh, diet and exercise on survival. So a number of studies um, going on. Um, and since I have a couple, two more minutes, I'm just going to quickly show you about the role of diet and exercise with colorectal cancer because there's some intriguing findings here. So Jeff Meyerhart out of Dana-Farber did show that physical activity is also associated with improved colon cancer survival. Strong association, this is the highest um, about two to three hours per week of physical activity improving survival of colon cancer versus the other levels. Interestingly though, pre-diagnosis physical activity was not associated with um, reduction in uh, or improved colon cancer survival. But yet when you look at the change from pre to post-diagnosis, the, uh, the uh, reference is no change in physical activity, but those who increased their activity after diagnosis had about a 50% reduction in death. Those who decreased their activity had an increased um, risk of death. So the message here is it's important to maintain your activity if you're active before diagnosis. Um, and if you're not active, it's not too late to start an exercise program after diagnosis. 
Um, what about the role of diet? You're all probably familiar with the WIND study, which um, was out of UCLA and a number of other sites around the country, which was a low-fat diet. Basically, they showed really no effect of reducing your fat intake on survival. When they stratified by um, ER stats, they did show among ER negative uh, an improvement in survival. It was um, a small sample size, though, so it's probably a chance finding. So low-fat diet, we're not quite sure if that improves um, prognosis. Similarly, the WELL study was a, uh, a randomized diet trial on breast cancer survival of high fruits and vegetables, low fat and, and high fiber. No effect um, of improving survival. So the role of diet, um, you know, these were strong, um, these were RCTs and showing really no benefit on survival. In a secondary analysis from the WELL study, when they just looked at the baseline before they were randomized, baseline physical activity levels and diet patterns on survival, so an observational study. They did show those with high physical activity levels and, and a, a favorable diet had the, um, uh, the, the best survival um, of breast cancer. So right, so there it's kind of implying that physical activity and with perhaps the combination of a healthy diet improves survival. Thank you for your time. I'd just like to acknowledge some of the funding sources and my uh, collaborators. Thank you.